Experts tell me that imitation is the highest form of flattery, but they called my posh English accent and King Charles passport identity theft. When I started telling stories and making things, I was immediately bored by process shots. There are only so many scenes of fasteners a man can handle. I needed characters, players, something to tell the story with as I assembled the final piece of art. Myself a wargamer and tactile tabletop enthusiast, I stole the design of the thief from Settlers of Catan, a game I don't own. This figure formed the base for kings, farmers, and hoplites, but it felt insufficient for God. So I made larger pieces, more detailed, stealing the iconic Corinthian helm for Ares, the wings for Thanatos, and crafting a skull with a daffodil for Persephone. These proto-chessmen were light, small, unsatisfying to move, and prone to tipping over. I briefly removed the pieces from videos, and their absence made me really sad. I needed something like them to capture the actors of these stories. Therefore, I grabbed my pith helmet and looted our collective cultural heritage, drawing inspiration from the long-standing Staunton chess set. With their wide and heavy base for stability and their clear silhouettes, the Staunton chessmen are allegedly used daily by 605 million chess players. If true, then the chess community is larger than Fortnite, Taylor Swift, and the Anglican Church combined. But the Staunton chessmen were not designed in a vacuum. This venerable chess set was the culmination of 1,200 years of chess history, which means there are 1,200 years of chess sets that didn't make the cut. Chess is a zero-sum two-player game with no hidden information. There are two sides, white and black, with 16 pieces per side arranged in two ranks. Eight pawns, two rooks, two knights, two bishops, a queen, and a king. Each piece has a unique move that I'll explain when it's relevant. The game ends when the king cannot escape being threatened by enemy material, called a checkmate. Similar to when an officer's lounge finds itself on the front lines and suddenly an armistice is signed. Chess can trace its roots to 500 CE. A group of deeply bored people in the Gupta Empire started sewing 8x8 game panels into their rugs and created a game called Chaturanga. That's right, it's not chess yet. Nobody knows the exact rules of Chaturanga, but let's give it the old college try. General consensus says that the king could move one step in any direction. The counselor could move one step diagonally. The chariot could move any number of steps horizontally or vertically. The horse moved in an L, jumping over intervening pieces. And the pawn could move one step forward and only captured diagonally. The elephant's move we are as likely to determine as an ivory baron is to find an elephant graveyard in the Amazon, as it is obscured by multiple conflicting accounts. The game ended when the king was captured, unless a skilled player could capture every other piece aside from their opponent's king, called bearing the king. Bearing the opponent's king is also a victory. Trade carried Chaturanga across the world, each culture adding, removing, and adapting the game. According to the Persian Book of Kings, Chaturanga arrived at the Shah's court because the Indians did not want to pay tribute to the Persians. Instead, the Indians sent a fancy Chaturanga set carved of painted ivory and teak wood along with a cunning wager. If the Persians cannot figure out the rules of the game, then the Indians don't have to pay. Amazingly, this fairy tale gambit nearly worked. Luckily for the Persians, there was a clever advisor at court, the sort of man who twirls a pencil-thin mustache and is more cunning than a fox disguised as a professor. The advisor figured out the game via intense study, and then he bested the Indians in a match. The Persians changed the name of the game to Shatranj, giving the elephant the movement rule of two steps diagonal jumping over the middle square, as well as solidifying the rules that pawns can be promoted to the counselor by reaching the opposite end of the board. The Persians also created a new victory condition called Shamat, translated to the king is helpless. In English, this would be checkmate. Uh-oh, all the neighbor kids have a hot new religion. Islam. The Muslim Rashidun dynasty takes all the Sassanids' lunch money and their Shatranj sets. The Muslims changed the name of the game to Chatranj, and the Caliphate changed leaders. But the new Umayyad Caliphs keep the conquest train running all the way into Spain bringing Chatranj with them. To stay hip with the cool Muslim kids, Chatranj pieces favor simple geometry, sometimes painted with abstract patterns, abstracting away any resemblance to the natural world. All necessary adjustments adjusted, Chatranj flourishes. The oldest chess manual we know about, the Kitab al Chatranj, is written in 850, containing some of the first chess problems and strategies. Chatranj is played in houses of wisdom all over the Muslim world. Meanwhile, in southern Europe, the Italians and the Spaniards started playing Chatranj, and when the game reached England, the name was translated to chess. But a localization problem emerges. Nobody in Europe knows anything about elephants or chariots but they do know about Catholic bishops and the scheming of thousands of petty nobles. Slowly, the game evolves to represent the court around each monarch. 
The elephant becomes a bishop, the counselor becomes a queen, and rooks become whatever the craftsperson fancies. In Macedonia, they're canons. A side note, for a long time the queen is referred to as Our Lady in Catholic nations, a nod to the Virgin Mary, but later Protestant nations will use queen to reject the reference to Catholic doctrine. Unfortunately, chess gameplay is a touch slow. Many players spending the first few turns moving pawns slowly across the board and moving their kings to safe locations where royalty can watch their men die in a civilized fashion. Therefore, cast Castling is added, and the pawns get a double step on their first move of the game. In the 1200s, bishops schemed their way into a diagonal move across any open square, fitting for the political angling the Catholic Church was doing at the time. Meanwhile, in 1401 CE, how is Chess in Baghdad doing? <laughs> In Spain, a new monarch is ascendant, Queen Isabella I of Castile. She's dynamic, fearless, and unifying the Iberian Peninsula. Suddenly, the very weak queen in chess is anachronistic. The Spaniards change the queen's move to unlimited steps in any direction. Predictably, this is controversial. Some call it Mad Queen's Chess. However, in 1492, before the king's rights advocates can act, Spain expels the Jews to mollify them. These Jews leave Spain, carrying copies of the Spanish rules for chess thanks to another controversial item, the printing press. Twenty years pre-expulsion, a lovesick Spaniard writes a love poem that plays out in a game of chess. While the game itself is subpar, this is the first time a chess game is reported move by move. Then, in 1575, another Spaniard gets frustrated by a late game double step and instead of giving in to the intrusive thoughts, he invents on Passant, where allied pawns can capture an enemy pawn that has used a double step to move past the allied pawn. Chess spreads like only wildfires, bad news, and lukewarm cream cheese can. All across Europe and beyond, people are playing chess. In 1737, newspapers have chess columns, using modern algebraic notation to communicate games. In 1769, the Mechanical Turk stunned Europe with its ability to beat human players, despite the showman's insistence and elaborate demonstrations that it was a mechanical marvel, he later admitted it was a con. The machine had a master hidden inside, playing by candlelight. In 1783, chess master Andre Danikin Filidor plays three simultaneous chess games while blindfolded. He will win two and draw the third. By the 1800s, chess was the European intelligentsia's game of choice. Romanticism had taken hold of much of Europe. Therefore, a new philosophy of chess, romantic chess, is born. A philosophy where honorable, beautiful gameplay takes priority over things like victory and strategic play. From this cohort of French and English masters, Howard Staunton emerged as the first world champion after an 1843 victory over Pierre-Charles Fournay de Saint-Amand. Staunton is an avid chess writer and masterful player. And what do these romantic masters use to play? Completely non-standard sets, typically tall and skinny chess sets like the St. George and Barleycorn set. These tend to be turned, no longer carved from ivory and precious stones, but instead made of wood. If you'll allow me a moment to editorialize, these are only slightly better better than Yoko Ono's all-white chess set. They are visually complicated, but without clear delineation between the pieces and prone to falling over thanks to their top-heavy form. Howard Staunton hates these sets. Enter architect and designer Nathaniel Cook. He designed a new chess set in 1850. Each chessman has a wide weighted base, distinct silhouette, and the whole set has an elegant slant from the royal couple to the rook. The knight in particular was inspired by the sculptures of Celine's horses from the Elgin marbles, which Nathaniel Cook would have been able to see at the British Museum. These marbles are named after Baron Elgin who carved them off the Parthenon and carted them back to jolly old England. These Greek artifacts live at the British Museum to this day, and if that sounds like it should cause pain and controversy, don't worry. It does. Staunton endorses Cook's design, and the two christened it the Staunton Chess Set. Then, in 1851, Howard Staunton hosted the first international chess tournament in London, using the Staunton set. At that tournament, the match called only The Immortal Game is Played, a truly marvelous chess match that this video is too short to contain. In 1873, Romanticism was on the back foot. New champions, led by Wilhelm Steinitz, replaced old romanticism with the practicality of scientific chess strategy. Chess evolved into a competitive sport, meaning sound openings, mid-games, and end-games are valued over the gambits and sacrifice plays of the Romantic era. Then, in 1927, the Fédération Internationale des Echecs, or World Chess Federation, takes over running tournaments, adopting the Staunton Chessmen as their official chess set. Challenge games continue escalating along with international tensions during the interwar years. In 1937, George Koltanowski plays 34 simultaneous games blindfolded and wins 24 of them. Oh no. 
It's the political movement who are synonymous with evil. Nazis. I hate Nazis. Because fascists must annex everything, because everything not controlled by them fuels their paranoia, the Nazis stick their whittle thumbs into chess, arguing that Aryans play brave, daring, and honorable chess, and Jews play disgusting, strategic chess, where it is all about material profit. This is, of course, nonsense. Then the Nazis got bodied into 2016 by the Allies. Chess is the first international sport to hold a tournament after World War II at Groningen in the Netherlands, 1946, with the Soviet Union and its champion Mikhail Botvinnik eking out a victory over the Dutch champion. Now modern chess is, well, it's modern. This is the version of chess we see a cross-section of humanity playing in the park. But despite the FIDE standardizing its rules and competitive play requiring the Staunton chess set, artists and designers continue to innovate on chess. Back in 1921, the Bauhaus movement inspires Joseph Hartwig to create a chess set that displays every chess piece's movement. Gone were the representations of armies and courts, instead a totally abstract representation of chess was created. Later, in 1970, the chess powerhouse that was the Soviet Union was sending cosmonauts to space for 17 days, the longest any human had been in space. They needed something to do while doing something no one had done before. A Soviet designer creates a spring-loaded chessboard with slots to hold the pieces in place. A brilliant piece of chess design that sadly never caught on. Then, finally, in 2013, the FID hires the architect Daniel Weil to update the Staunton chess set. Weil uses the Staunton set as a base, but sets out to refine the architectural discipline of the set. He gives each piece the same base, but adjusts the diameter to imply piece power. He also refines the knight. No more is it a wooden carving of a marble carving, instead its faceted features honor its material. The Wild set is now the official set of the FIDE, but it is unlikely this will be the final chess set of World Chess. Who knows what could come next?